Good morning, everyone. Uh, very exciting to be here. This is the first ever Facebook Live um, for the Countryside Alliance shooting campaign, and I'm in a pretty wonderful uh, wood in Sussex. If I do that, you might be able to see. This is uh, a wood right next to my house um, down in East Sussex. And yeah, it's uh, one of my favorite places to be. And so I'm pretty happy to be here. Hopefully the uh, 4G connection will be um, sufficient to, to uh, see where to keep, to keep the stream going. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions you might have about shooting uh, a sport and a um, industry and a community which I'm absolutely passionate about, grew up uh, amongst a shooting community and have always understood it's... Um, its kind of relationship to the local landscape and to the economy. So do ask any questions. Um, do let me know any, any, anything you really uh, want, to, want to ask about the work of the Countryside Alliance. Obviously at the moment, um, we've all been in lockdown for uh, a seemingly endless amount of time and we're not quite sure how and when we're going to emerge from that. Hopefully the um, government's timeline for opening up the country and easing the restrictions continues um, to, to stay in place and that we uh, manage to all stay safe and avoid any uh, repeat of, of stricter restrictions but um, yeah hopefully that's that has hopefully that can happen and obviously those restrictions um, have had a potentially serious impact on the uh, shooting community um, and shoots planning for next year um, so any questions around that do do ask um, I've got a question here from Kofi a serious question what can be done to stop animal rights uh, activism and anti-terrorism um, and what's the best word for it well Kofi that is a really pretty pretty uh, mega question um, and all we can really do at the moment, there are a couple of things. As individuals, when we encounter it, we must immediately uh, report it to the police if it's an immediate ongoing um, situation and you can see that people are endangered, then call 999. Uh, if not, take as many details as you possibly can and report it um, to the to the police uh, in due course. But we must make sure that these incidents are recorded and reported to the police because the more they're reported and recorded, the more resources in due course the police can uh, give to them. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, as an organisation in the Alliance, we're lobbying all the time for laws to be strengthened and tightened. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's work that's ongoing. And one of the examples actually not in, in so relevant to shooting, although it does is relevant to shooting, is that we've... Um, lobbied for powers for police to uh, remove the masks of saboteurs and that's absolutely critical in identifying them uh, and so that's one thing and we're we're really pushing to get the police now that they have those powers to use them and use them effectively um, so that's one thing but definitely keep reporting it to the police martin wants to know when do we think lead will be banned for uh, clay shooting I'm not sure um, it will, will ever be banned. It's certainly something that we're not pushing for. Uh, lead, clay shooting often, um, most of the time, takes place in an enclosed uh, area. Um, so there's limited impact environmentally. And also, you, clays, you don't eat them after they've been shot. Um, so there's no impact on the food chain. So realistically, clays don't need to ever have a lead ban, Martin. However, I would say that um, using steel, I know uh, and have spoken to some clay professional clay competition shooters who have started to use steel uh, because they, it tat patterns more tightly than lead. So, so uh, there is no need for lead to be banned for clay sh shooting or indeed to move away from it. But um, it may be that steel, as the technology progresses and steel cartridges becomes the favoured um, material for clay shooting. Um, reading Kofi's follow-up points on, uh, on, on, on saboteurs. Um, so that's, that's, again, yeah, absolutely agree, Kofi. We need to have a uh, coordinated lobby lobbying um, effort. And, and the, the, we, we, are, we are undertaking that. And certainly 
all the time we work with the political team in the kind of side alliance to work out who are the best politicians to reach, who are the people within the civil service. Um, you know, shoot saboteur, saboteurs and hunt saboteurs are uh, a real menace and they need to be stopped uh, in, in any way really. And so we are, we are working very hard on that and we actually produced guidance for shoots about what to do. You can find on our website about what to do if you're a shooter or a hunt and saboteurs turn up um, we produce guidance on how to contact the police, helplines to ring um, in the first instance, what to do at that particular point. Um, Martin again, rough shooting, uh, lead in rough shooting. Well, the thing is, Martin, that there is um, really quite clear evidence that uh, birds such as um, Game Conservancy, Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, when it was the Game Conservancy, did research to show birds like the English partridge do have increased early mortality mortality um, from picking up and ingesting uh, lead shot and using it to grit uh, in their gizzards so what you know digesting all of their food and that means that the lead is much more concentrated um, in their system it doesn't pass through they use it to help their digestion and so jointly with the other um, organizations we've called for a voluntary transition we don't want to see legislation we want to see a real phased approach that enables alternatives to be developed that enables consultation to happen very widely over the course of the next five years and so that's what we're working towards is to make sure that in five years time as a community we're in a position to uh, have suitable alternatives that work for almost all guns, that work for people's budgets, that and that work also um, effectively in a in a lethal way uh, to ensure animal um, welfare is maintained. Uh, so that that we are. Um, absolutely uh, uh, looking for a phased approach. It wouldn't be a ban, but we're, we're hoping that in five years, and we're working towards in five years, steel or non-lead alternatives being an obvious choice for anyone um, shooting. Um, Rilla Turner has a really good question and one that I absolutely um, think is so important. Evidence that the actions of shooting boost conservation and biodiversity is vital. What natural capital calculators can we use to measure increases on our land to give this evidence? So um, that's a really good question. Shooting is the biggest contributor to conservation in this country. Uh, 3.9 million volunteer work days go into cons conservation efforts from shooters. Uh, and so they um, absolutely do, do, do that. 3.9 million volunteer work days, greater than any other um, conservation effort by the likes of other conservation uh, societies such as the RSPB. It's absolutely monumental. And really, in terms of... Um, trying to evidence base that what you can do is um get someone like the game and wildlife conservation trust to come and do a shoot assessment and they are i would highly recommend anyone who's involved in running a shoot um contacts them because they will send out a scientific advisor and they will assess your shoot they will look at your areas of cover cropping your stocking densities if you're releasing birds what cover crops you're growing uh, your patterns of feeding your predator control and they will say actually this is the net biodiversity gain to this area of land because of shooting and it's a rigorous scientific approach that is then written in paper but on top of that they will also suggest things you could do to take that even further and so one simple thing that a lot of shoots lowland shoots um, could do is uh, where they grow a strip of maize which is obviously quite easy to cultivate compared to other crops and um, very good at holding birds such as pheasants alongside that they could have a one or two meter strip of something else um, a wild bird seed mix or something like that and the game conservancy can advise on what other cover crops would be uh, beneficial to all sorts of pollinators and songbirds and provide additional feeding so um, and which ones would suit your soil type the best so i would highly recommend getting a shoot assessment done uh, because that is the concrete evidence about the difference your shoot is making um, uh stuart smith here why are pro countryside and shooting groups reactive not proactive i have to say i um think that's completely um completely untrue i think we've been proactive uh kind of ceaselessly really uh proactive obviously there are a huge amount of um 
things that happen in government that we have to respond to uh, so it's really important to be able to uh, react and be able to um, have the contacts in place and the strategies in place to be able to react to legislation that comes uh, completely out of the blue um, or, or pronouncements like that however it, we are also incredibly proactive our announcement on um, lead was just one one example of that we were far ahead of the legislation and the reality is legislation would be coming and we could lose lead in two to three years but because of our proactiveness DEFRA have said we're not going to legislate now we're not going to um, pursue that because the self-regulation proposed by the shooting bodies uh, is a step in absolutely the right direction and so that is an example of proactive work really recently that has stopped government legislation and has bought the shooting community the time to develop uh, alternatives that are, are necessary um so that's uh that's that's good uh, uh, alex watson a very old friend of mine has um commented on my beard uh the the yesterday when i we put out a promotion for this it was looking rather ragged and a couple of my friends said it needed a, a tidy up so that's that's happened for the inaugural countryside alliance um facebook live uh so so that's that's good um i'm just going to quickly kind of go back to uh, Rilla Turner and the evidence of conservation and talk a bit more more about that um, you know I shooting is so bound up in conservation they're really quite inseparable and habitats that have shoots on um, on their or, or landscapes that have shoots uh, over them which is actually two-thirds of the rural land in Britain are generally have much much higher biodiversity and you just really need to think about it in any kind of pragmatic sense if you have a field that is used for grazing or you have a field that is used for agriculture that is um obviously a profitable uh hopefully a profitable um land use however when you have shooting what you do is you take away part of that uh, agricultural system and plant habitat that provides feed and cover for a myriad of species and that creates a much more diverse um, patchwork of different habitats so you might have a oilseed rape or a, or a um, wheat field but then you have a 20 meter strip of um, kale or quinoa or maize or something like that and suddenly you've got a two different habitats which which wildlife can uh, utilize and they really respond well to having a patchwork of different habitats equally that extends to the management of woodlands where you create larger rides perhaps for guns to stand on but that those larger rides let in light and enable uh, a different um, woodland floor where the light comes in to perhaps where there's denser woodland and so all of those things create such diverse habitat and i think that it's kind of completely unequivocal that conservation and shooting go hand in hand so um on our website as well you can find out lots of information on exactly what it is about shooting that helps um biodiversity and so it's not just uh finding out the natural capital calculators like the shoot assessment I mentioned but also knowing the quite clear techniques that take place either because people are interested and passionate about shooting or because shooting provides an alternative income for the land use uh, to growing crops um, so it's all, all, all very beneficial. Um, uh, Chris says um, <laughs> um, Chris is suggesting that uh, we replace our woodlands with fast food outlets um, and I, uh, I think that the point is uh, in that again goes back you know if we were to apart from the joke to take it slightly more seriously is that um, one of the things about uh, wildlife is that giving it an economic value means that it really really um, it, it has the longevity to stay it doesn't just rely on people's um, doesn't just rely on people's kind of generosity of spirit so 
if a landowner really likes shooting and makes a income from his shoot, he's much more likely to plant a wood and be very you know, satisfied with that land use rather than perhaps um, build a KFC, as, as Chris mentioned. Uh, Daisy's asked, what can we expect to see in the countryside at this time of year? Well, Daisy, it is literally the best time of year to be out in the countryside, even though it's not the shooting season and we can't get out um, and go shooting uh, for pheasants and partridges and, and those kind of things at the moment. It is literally a hive of life um, at the moment. All sorts of, every, everything's happening. I think probably my favorite thing, I'll just put the camera on again, and you can see uh, this is the wood I'm in and it's covered with, there's you know, areas of, of, of um, you know, woodland floor that's uh, really quite dense and full of wildlife and insects and then areas of woodland floor that are uh, much barer and that patchwork is so important to um, promoting biodiversity. Uh, my favourite animals to see at this time of year, probably the most kind of emblematic are the migrants that come from um, Africa or other places around the world and uh, come to this country to breed and it is absolutely wonderful to um, see those and I would say just a small story. I actually, about uh, two weeks ago, was sitting in this wood and heard a nightingale um, in the evening and managed to get just below the tree where it was absolutely singing out its lungs. It would have come from sub-Saharan Africa and was looking to find uh, a mate with its iconic song. And nightingales are absolutely amazing creatures and show the importance actually of shooting in, in some degree once again. Their numbers have declined hugely. Uh, they're one of the few woodland ground nesting birds that we have in this country and they the, one of the theories about their decline is that um, deer have uh, foraged and overbrowsed the woodland understory and as a result they are uh, don't have the same nesting habitat and so it's really important to um, to make sure that the deer cull is completed um, and by ma managing and, and culling deer, which can grow and ex uh, their population can grow at an exponential rate, you need to cull 30% of your deer population each year to keep them at the same level. Um, the, the, you can actually, by culling the deer and maintaining the cull, you can make sure that the woodland understory uh, is still um, you know, it's still there and the nightingales still have habitats to nest and, and as I showed you on the screen earlier the understory here is quite thick there's lots of uh, habitat we don't have many deer in these woods and the nightingales are obviously thriving here as a result. Um, Sam Roberts has asked how can you have socially distant shoots in the upcoming season especially for non-shooters who enjoy a social day out such as beaters? Um, Sam, that is a pretty, pretty good question and certainly something that is at the forefront of our mind. And there's no doubt that uh, the ongoing repercussions of COVID-19 will in some way affect um, this, this shooting season. One of the things that we're recommending at the moment is that shoot owners look to their shoots and work out how they could possibly structure their drives so that they could walk from one drive to the next. Um, so that's one way, because obviously <clears throat> being in the beater's wagon or the gun bus is, is when you're possibly most in closest proximity with uh, other people on the day. So if you can structure the drives in a way that you can walk, um, the social distancing regulations at the moment are maintaining two meters uh, between people. So that uh, obviously still allows a conversation and so thinking about if you have the opportunity of somewhere to um, gather afterwards, uh, so if it's, if it's ideally kind of outside, perhaps having lunch earlier in the day slightly, if it's uh, outside somewhere where, uh, and it's a nice day or under a form of lean-to, and I think possibly people bringing their own um, lunch and, and not sharing that kind of equipment. So you can still have uh, a social time two metres away. Uh, it is obviously pretty pretty sad that it, we won't almost certainly be seeing um, the same kind of uh, kind of close-knit camaraderie that you would expect around a, a lunch table. Um, but we've got to remember that the prime thing is to keep everyone safe and to avoid any form of second spike um, 
around so keeping social distance is important but i think with a with rejigging your 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 shoot slightly there is no reason that um assuming the government uh, uh there hasn't been a second spike and it's considered safe to do so um it, there's no reason why you still couldn't have a feeling of um you know camaraderie and community on a on a shoot day um over the Ian asked, uh, over the last few elections, many pro hunting shooting supporters have delivered leaflets for MPs um, with a view to possible repeal, uh, I'm guessing, of the Hunting Act. What are the prospects of this ever happening, especially when Boris's other half isn't a fan of what we do? Um, well, in terms of repeal of the, the Hunting Act, at the moment that isn't, in, isn't uh, it's certainly not my area of expertise. I'm in the shooting department um, and, and Polly, my colleague on hunting, will I'm sure be doing something similar to this to answer questions about hunting in due course. Um, but to pick up on one kind of element of that, we have a really good working relationship uh, with this government. The confidence of such a large uh, majority does mean that we feel that we can get important pieces of legislation um you know being driven forward uh, particularly around the earlier question about um how to to properly impose uh laws that make it harder for shoot saboteurs and hunt saboteurs to um be so aggressive and, and things like that and aggravated trespass was um one of the things that we were we were hugely um pleased to to see so uh, or to laws against aggravated trespass rather hugely pleased to see those um come into force so uh at the, at at present um you know i would say we have a very good relationship with uh, with the government and we're, we're hugely positive um in our outlook moving forward with that obviously things around covid have meant that, that a lot of the proposed legislation has been taken a back seat as we deal with this pandemic um but going forward we're, we're very helpful about, ho hopeful about that relationship um adrian blackmore asked do you think driven shooting is going to be possible this year adrian i absolutely think that some form of driven shooting is going to be possible relating to sam roberts's earlier um question the the but the main thing we must all really understand is that the prime focus of the government quite rightly is on keeping us all safe and pre preventing a um a second uh, wave of covid so that's a pretty pretty important um thing to that's the, by far the most important thing however with social distancing in place uh perhaps reorganizing the shoot so you can walk between um drives or people going in individual vehicles if they're unable to do that um will uh will will we should be able to see some form of driven shooting and i think it's very compelling you know driven shooting is such an important economic driver um for rural britain in exmoor for example 95 percent of winter tourism is driven by driven shooting uh the value of driven shooting adds up to more than all of the agricultural subsidies combined in exmoor you know to to wipe that out um at a time of year when there isn't obviously summer tourism happening it's all, all happening during the shooting season uh it's it would be a devastating blow after this summer where tourism hasn't been able to happen and so there are really significant economic imperatives um, to suggest that driven shooting needs to be considered amongst the the first things to be allowed um, when the time comes to that so so i'm very hopeful and there's very good reasons why uh, it should be allowed to continue from an economic perspective and i think if we continue on the right trajectory that we're on at the moment in suppressing covid a socially distant shoot day uh should be should be very possible um here we are bill uh says facing the camera there we are there we go um george gunn i uh, thank you for that tip on on putting the camera up here probably better um George Gunn, wonderful photographer who we featured in, in the Countryside Alliance shooting newsletters recently, says, will we see a rise in more affordable walked up or walk on stand one types of shooting in the coming season? And will this be the end of commercial um, shoots uh, with lots of birds being put down in small areas? 
Uh, George, so the first thing is, I think that it's very probable that we will see a change in um, people's consumer, uh, like consumers of shoots in the type of shooting that they're buying. I think it really is possible that we will see a change in that. Um, I was speaking to last week, Chris Horn, the director of Guns on Pegs, and he said that they are seeing an increase in um, inquiries around things like uh, walked up woodcock and snipe shooting or going for a weekend stuck flighting or something like that, um, that, that perhaps previously those people would have bought a driven day instead. It's obviously that form of shooting is uh, slightly more informal. Um, it can be undertaken perhaps in a more easily in a socially distanced manner um, because it's all walking anyway. Uh, it doesn't come with the trappings of, of a large sit down lunch perhaps. And critically, I think it's much more affordable. Um, and at this time, we've obviously seen that uh, it's, been, it's been pretty difficult uh, with lots of people being furloughed and Possibly as that scheme comes to an end, job security will be uh, far less and we're looking, as everyone knows, at a recession. So I think that those forms of shooting will be more popular. And I think that that is a really good thing because um, the more styles of shooting we can get people into, the more um, uh, varieties of, of, of the sport that people can experience, I think the more passionate they become and the more willing they are to go on record and and talk about the value of shooting and what it brings to the landscape and the economy. The second point about commercial shoots and uh, will this be the end of it? Um, I think as a community, we're all, there are um, instances where commercial shoots have historically and, and, and some ongoing, you know, operated in a way that isn't uh, wholly positive for conservation. However, um, as a community, the, the response cannot be that we need to therefore just abandon uh, those shoots and that aspect of shooting um, you know and 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 just bury it what we need to do is work towards ensuring that every shoot that's operating regardless of scale is um, contributing a net biodiversity gain and there are a few schemes that are being worked up uh, at the moment to ensure that um, a lot of the sporting agents realize that uh, the conservation status of a shoot needs to be positive and uh, it's vital to securing the long-term future of shooting and so um, I would suggest things like the BGA uh, which are the British Game Alliance which are a shoot assurance and game assurance scheme they really need to um, shoots I, I would I would say that the shoots really need to join that uh, as part of securing the future of shooting it's an amazing scheme it's done incredible things in a short period of time for the game market but they also have uh, standards around stocking densities and things like that and I, that's been a wonderful um, thing to be involved in from a countryside alliance perspective and I think that by ensuring that you know agents uh, are selling shoots that are audited for their conservation credentials um, will mean that regardless of scale regardless of commerciality they are having a net biodiversity uh, gain so I think that that's the would be the way to do that uh, my colleagues want to know <laughs> if the beard is a permanent fixture or temp temporary it's been a permanent fixture for almost a decade so um so that's uh that's that's um I think it probably is going to stay a bit longer although I have had some reports that you know masks don't work quite so well with beards and and should we need to be wearing masks more often as a result of covid it might um it might come off we'll see um R Roop Turnbull says, couldn't agree more about natural capital. Elms value, which is the environmental land management scheme value, um, is what keeps humans alive. Shooting is so much more than just killing. Uh, it's about conserving and preserving our biodiversity by being involved in work parties who all share a similar interest. Shooting and conservation go hand in hand. Uh, Roop, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. It couldn't be more about understanding the environment that we live in, understanding how wild animals um, need the habitat, they need the safety net that also goes with things like predator control. Um, you know, it is absolutely no coincidence that, uh, I mean, this is a classic example, things like um, curlews and golden plover and lapwings have been plummeting in their, uh, across their range 
really, um, as have birds of prey such as merlins, but where they exist on grouse um, moors that are managed by gamekeepers, their numbers have been increasing. If you provide the right habitat, if you set aside land for the promotion of biodiversity, if you provide the protection of predator control, which is something that is all paid for by shooting and supported, you know, and not necessarily by particularly wealthy landowners who just want to throw money at it, but because it makes money and can support itself, or because there are bands of volunteers, like you said, who take place, um, take part in work parties, and they have an area that they manage for that, for uh, the habitat, for the shooting, for the uh, camaraderie, and for the absolutely huge benefit of really delicious wild game at the end of it, which is an incredible output. Um, you know, we, we are preserving and securing this the, these species for future generations. Um, Jonathan uh, Snowden says, planting crops has encouraged different species uh, in the countryside, but people walking across potato fields thinking it's okay to take shortcuts when there isn't even a footpath. I think that's been, Jonathan, a, a real problem um, during this lockdown as people have, have had the time, perhaps they haven't been at work to go on longer walks and explore the countryside. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult path to tread. Really, I think the onus falls on all of us as people who love the countryside and love shooting to try and educate people about the countryside code, about closing gates, about sticking to the footpaths, about the peace and quiet that nature needs to really, really thrive. Um, but the flip side is that we're getting people from the towns now, because of COVID, engaged in the countryside. And the greater the engagement, the more opportunity there is and the more fertile uh, their minds for learning about the countryside. So really broadening that education um, network to the countryside, making sure that we're involved in talking about it at schools and things like that is an important, is an important part. Um, so um, here we are, Roop, who hit the nail on the head about um, uh, conservation earlier. Um, says, uh, how have you adapted to the challenges from wild justice? Lots of commercial shoots are run extremely well, but a few ruin it for the rest. Well, I just mentioned to George Gunn, uh, his point about commercial shoots, similar, similar point, you know, there are a few perhaps who don't, uh, abide by the rules and don't promote biodiversity and conservation in the way that we would, um, like. However, so many are also unbelievably well run. And, uh, and, and I think that we shouldn't lump them all together. Many commercial shoots are the absolute apogee of what we should look towards. They have the gamekeepers um, managing the land in a sensitive manner. They provide the uh, food even beyond um, the season for, for the birds that are uh, still on the ground and obviously to the benefit of a host of other um, wild species. So, so but the few, what we need to do is try and ensure that the uh, few that aren't cooperating, you know, at agent level, we we ensure that only audited shoots that demonstrate a net biodiversity gain are the ones being sold. And I think there's a great, I mean, I'm hugely hopeful about that because um, if you look at the recent Guns on Pegs survey, anyone really under the age of 50 is really interested in the environmental con credentials of a shoot and I think that will become a, a real selling point and marketing point for them going forward so I think the market will also help a lot with that. In terms of adapting to the challenges of wild justice um, so recently we actually uh, became an interested party and uh, were influential in getting one of their um, judicial reviews that they'd um, initiated thrown out of court uh we are obviously registered to be and will continue to be registered to be an interested party in anything that they um that, that, that they take going forward and i think it's, it comes back to the, also the point about education we must ensure that people realize that what they're suggesting is absolutely catastrophic for wildlife their uh, action that led to the temporary repeal of the general licenses was the most damaging thing to happen to rare um, flora and fauna in this country uh, certainly you know in in my lifetime really in terms of from a proposed conservation group it's absolutely shocking and i think as long as we can uh, communicate effectively to our members and to the wider world that what they're suggesting is not conservation what they're suggesting is ideologically driven dogma um, that answers none of the questions that really need to be asked about how we promote biodiversity in this country uh, and, and is simply their own um, agenda that has nothing to do with wildlife or conservation. 
Um, Uh, to what extent will we need data in the future uh, to make informed decisions and show that land management is based on outcomes, not outputs? If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So, I mean, that goes back to me suggesting that all shoots get a game conservancy uh, shoot biodiversity assessment um, done so that they can have a baseline and learn about what the biodiversity would be like if there wasn't a shoot and the biodiversity now if there is a shoot and gives them tips to um, improve that biodiversity. Uh, so, so that would be one way of um, measuring it and providing data. I think one of the most interesting things that's going on at the moment slightly related to this is that um, with Natural England and DEFRA, we're looking at how uh, licenses for avian predator control can be um, more effectively issued. Uh, it has been a bit of a debacle by Natural England who have been, uh, quite frankly, very reluctant to issue the necessary licenses. And um, one of the key points uh, that we've been making is that these areas that have been designated as special protected areas or special areas of conservation have these designations often because they've been managed for shooting and therefore have the biodiversity that makes them so special because of that management. Um, and so that's something that we're taking forward to try and uh, demonstrate how management for shooting and predator control have actually shaped the environments which we consider the most precious and biodiverse in our country. Um, do you feel that the RSPB has an agenda which is odds with game shooting despite its claims to the contrary? Uh, also from Adrian Blackmore. I absolutely do, I'm afraid. Um, but I also think it's important to say that at ground level, we get on very well with, um, you know, RSPB members and RSPB, uh, <clears throat> you know, volunteers who work in reserves. And um, often we, we have worked, you know, side by side with them in things, you know, and things like wildfowling clubs often are next to RSPB reserves as well. And often they have, they work together in um, work parties and have similar, similar kind of conservation goals. But what is quite clear is that at senior level, there are some top officials in the RSPB who have a real agenda uh, when it comes to uh, driven shooting. And in particular, we're seeing it at the moment in driven grouse shooting. So um, there definitely is a uh, real, um, real agenda there and the you know one demonstration uh of this is that they've um they kind of announced this review into uh game bird shooting and their review and consultation that they put out publicly um was was completely skewed to provide answers which were against shooting and they didn't conform to the principles of um and the conditions of our uh, environmental treaties that we're part of as part of the um, eu they went far beyond the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's sustainability metrics. Uh, really, it was, it was completely extraordinary and designed ent entirely to restrict shooting. Um, and that was obviously done at a very senior level. So uh, it's very sad because um, the RSPB is a very old and venerable institution and it, there is the potential that we could do so much work uh, together. But on the times when we have worked together, um, such as the development of the Hen Harry uh, brood management scheme and the Hen Harrier Joint Action Plan, they actually you know, left that group and um, refused to work with us simply because uh, of their ideological anti-shooting agenda, which is very, very sad. I've been on here now for 35 uh, minutes, which is much longer than I thought I would be. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Um, I'm sure this won't be the last Facebook Live we do. And in future, if you have any ideas for... Um, uh, specifically themed Facebook lives related to shooting or anything like that I'd be delighted to hear them and we can um, come online again and answer your questions um, in, a, in a different setting. Thank you everyone I hope you have a wonderful day and look forward to um, the shooting season but in the meantime enjoy the wonderful spring weather that we have and the incredible blossoming of wildlife all around us. Bye bye.